Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you Maryland Governor and Chairman of the National Governors Association, Larry Hogan. Governor Hogan was sworn in as the 62nd Governor of the State of Maryland on January 21, 2015. In 2018, he was overwhelmingly re-elected to a second four-year term, receiving the most votes of any Maryland gubernatorial candidate and becoming only the second Republican governor to be re-elected in the 242-year history of the state. During the conversation, Governor Hogan discusses his brand new book, which launches on the date of this virtual event, entitled Still Standing, Surviving Cancer, Riots, a Global Pandemic, and the Toxic Politics that Divide America. Governor Hogan originally submitted the book to his publisher on February 1st, just before the coronavirus pandemic hit the United States. They then delayed the publication for two months so he could add five chapters about combating the coronavirus, the economic crisis, and dealing with the White House, which he says made for a more timely and interesting book. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Governor Larry Hogan and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director John Highbush. Governor Hogan, just absolutely great to have you uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's so great to be with uh, you. Thank you. Well, and, and in conjunction with what a great book, Governor. I think this is probably your first, and but it, it's going to turn out to be your best because there's just some fantastic stories in it. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's such an honor to be with you today, and, and thank you for saying that. It, it probably is going to be my best and maybe my worst book as well, since it's my only one, but, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I hope, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope other people will as well. Um, I, you know, when I read it uh, right there in the first couple of chapters, uh, the reader uh, is reminded of the fact that you come from a political family. I mean, uh, your your father, uh, Larry Hogan, uh, in Congress in the 70s um, and uh, ran for the Senate, uh, I think was, uh, had another major job in, uh, in the, um, Maryland. Um, you, you just come from a pedigree in Maryland that was truly important to your background, right? Well, yeah, thank you for mentioning my dad. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of him. He served in Congress uh, for, for three terms back in the, uh, back in the 70s and uh, gave up a safe seat in Congress to run for governor. But uh, I learned a lot about uh, public service and integrity from my dad. I spent most of my career in, in the private sector, but um, certainly probably had something to do with my early interest in, in politics and uh, the reason why I, I took, I took a, an interest in getting involved. Well, your dad, uh, famous for uh, Call Him As He Sees Him, and as you well know, one incredible moment of fame, uh, he, him being the first Republican member of the House, uh, the first uh, Republican, I think, on the House Judiciary Committee to uh, support the impeachment of President Nixon, right? Well, you know, I was in high school at the time, and, um, you know, my dad was sitting on that House Judiciary Committee. He was a, he was a strong supporter of uh, President Nixon's, and um, I got a chance to meet uh, the president, and we can't, they campaigned together. I think my dad was, uh, you know, fond of Nixon, thought he did a good job on foreign policy, and um, especially with respect to China. And um, he he was one of the folks on the Judiciary Committee fighting to make sure that the process was fair, pushing back when he thought that the Democrats were were um, being too partisan. He fought to make sure that the president could uh, present his own. Uh, you know, witnesses and uh, uh, present evidence. And, but he was, a you know, a, a former FBI agent and a, and a Georgetown lawyer who, 
after seeing all the evidence, it, it, uh, it pained him, uh, but he really believed that, uh, you know, the president uh, had committed impeachable offenses. He was the first Republican on the committee to come out and say so. And at the time, a lot of Republicans were awfully mad at him uh, in the White House and his friends in Congress and, and, and folks, uh, voters in the district. But it's the thing he's probably most remembered for uh, and uh, the thing I'm most proud of him about because he had the courage to stand up and and do put put aside his own political career uh, and uh, and put aside you know party loyalty and personal affection to do what he thought was right for the country. Yeah, it runs in the family. Uh, that's a courageous act. Uh, speaking of your dad, one other point I just wanted to make because I just had to smile uh, about it. I know he ran for the Senate in 1982, uh, two years into the Reagan presidency, and. I, uh, in re doing some research, I found we, we have a lot of scripts here that President Reagan used uh, to support uh, members and senators uh, running during his, his, their campaigns during his White House years. And there's a great script in, uh, we've got a governor, uh, well, President Reagan speaking about your dad. And uh, I brought it with me, uh, President Reagan said, uh, for an advertisement for him, we don't need rubber stamps in the Senate. What we need are hardworking people of ability and integrity, like Larry Hogan, who are willing to contribute their brains and hard work to building the American future you and I believe in so deeply. I thought it was just wow. great to see that. You know, I think that's the first time I've heard that. I don't remember it from back then, and that's, uh, that's really incredible. I mean, thanks for digging that up and sharing it with me. I'll, I'll send you a copy, Governor. <clears throat> Now, a lot of people admire Ronald Reagan, but you are truly an authentic Reagan Republican. It has to be the case, right? Because you've got some history that uh, I'd love for you to talk about with respect to uh, the president. Sure. Well, so, you know, my dad uh, first got in, involved in politics in the late 60s when I became kind of interested. Uh, I was involved in teenage Republicans and, and college Republicans. And, but when I was coming out of, when I was in college, it was in and it was 1976. Um, my dad, who was in the uh, house with with President Gerald Ford, and who I got a chance to meet, he and his family. My dad was chairing Ford's uh, campaign for re-election. My dad had a big part in Ford becoming the vice president and then the president um, because of his role. And and he's a, a great uh, man and a great leader. But I was and I liked him. Um, but I was so enamored with Reagan that I in '76 I was I was at the convention as an alternate delegate. Uh, I was just a young kid um, and the youngest member of the delegation and uh, maybe maybe the youngest person at the convention uh, on the floor. But I was marching around uh, with my <laughs> my Reagan uh, sign and my Reagan hat, because I just you know, thought he was such a, you know, he just, the, his positive vision for the future and the way he spoke just reached me in a way that, you know, frankly, Gerald Ford didn't. Uh, and my dad got so angry with me because here's, he, he's, a, he's a friend of, of Ford's and chairing the campaign. He's like, what are you doing out there supporting Reagan? I said, but I really like him. So uh, I was a true believer in, in 76 uh, when he was unsuccessful. And then you know, I got I got involved. I was a I was a chairman of, of Youth for Reagan. Worked in the campaign. Was a delegate in 1980 and in '84. And uh, you know, you know, no nobody had more of an impact on me, or you know, nobody's philosophy was I more interested in than Ronald Reagan. I was kind of coming of age. Uh, you know, right right out of college uh, when he became president. I, I, I served on the inaugural committee, and uh, you know, was just a uh, you know, it made a, it was the guy who I still look back to and quote all the time and, and, and think about, you know, this is the, the, the kind of leader that I aspire to be. Yeah, neat, neat. Um, now, this is your first book, I believe. Some who finish their first book uh, look back on it as a moment of uh, exhilaration and joy, and some have found the process miserable. Where, where do you fit in? Uh, well, in the it, process? It, 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 I, I actually enjoyed it. It was a little bit cathartic, I guess. So I, I, wrote, I wrote most of the book. When I first, I won in 2014 as governor of Maryland, which was nearly an impossible thing to do. We had the highest percentage of Democratic voters of any state in America. I had very little money. No one expected us to win. I was the second Republican in 50 years to be elected. 
Um, and when we pulled that off, people said, boy, you should write a book about how, how you did that. And I said, I haven't really accomplished anything. I can't, I can't write a book. And then I went through, uh, you know, after 90 days of being governor, the, the riots in Baltimore that we, we, we got, uh, you know, credited with doing a good job of handling. They said, you should write about that experience. And then I battled this life-threatening cancer while I was governor after five months in, they said, you have to talk about this. And then one a huge reelection and, and became the second governor in 242 years, Republican in Maryland to be reelected. They go, you have to write about this. So eventually I got around to it. I finished the book and turned it in February 1st, right before this coronavirus crisis. Uh, and it was, um, you know, it took a long time as, as you know, uh, to, to write the book, but um, I enjoyed the process and I hope people will enjoy reading it. I, I asked the publisher to put it on hold. It was supposed to be out almost two months uh, earlier. And, um, and they could only delay it until the end of July, but they asked me to add, to make it more current, some of the things that were going on today with my leadership of the National Governors Association and with what was going on with fighting the global pandemic and the economic crisis we're dealing with. So I think it makes for a more interesting book, but it was, it was difficult to get all this done. And, and of course we're having, we had planned a big uh, book tour around the country and now we're doing all of it virtually because we're still dealing with the crisis and, uh, you know, be, because it's, it's just impossible to have uh, in-person events these days. So well, thank you for yeah, sure, giving sure. us this opportunity with you for our first event. Yeah, happy to. Uh, Governor, uh, first, congratulations on uh, winning a tough fight on cancer. I uh, unfortunately have had the same experience uh, diagnosed as stage three, different kind of cancer that I fought, but... Uh, just magnificent accomplishment for you to have been able to fight and beat that disease just a few months into your first term as Maryland's governor. It's just, how is it possible for you to have fought that fight and run the state at the same time? Well, God bless you. I'm glad that you made it successfully through uh, your battle. I'll tell you, it really, uh, it changed me as a person. It made me realize the things that are important. And I've met so many incredible people that went through tougher battles than my own and you know, got to meet their families and to see what they, they go through. And um, it's, it's something I'm going to be involved in forever and uh, trying to raise awareness and raise money for organizations and try to fight until we find cures for these diseases. But yeah, I had only been governor for five months. We just won this big, huge, uh, overwhelming upset victory, the biggest one in the country. Um, and then um, I had my first legislative session after putting together an entire, you know, government, uh, you know, in an overwhelmingly, you know, a democratic monopoly state, uh, and uh, we cut taxes for the first time. We balanced the budget. You know, uh, we 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 got rid of a 5.1 billion dollar deficit all in the first 90 days. Then battled the riots, and 60 days later, I uh, got hit with this this news uh, that we came out of the blue. We I was on my first trade mission to Asia. And um, I had, you know, wasn't feeling a, really that well. I just had aches and pains and I was a little tired, but I didn't think it was anything serious. Went to the doctor and ended up having doctors come in and tell me that I had advanced and aggressive uh, cancer all over my body from my neck to my groin. And it ended up being a, almost an 18 month uh, total battle with 24 hour a day chemotherapy. And I was, I was dealing with all of that while being governor, uh, a brand new governor in a very tough uh, state with a lot of things going on, but um, it, uh, and I talk about this experience in my book, and um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, it, it really, I got to meet so many people, I tell some of the stories about the people I met and what it was like going through that, but, uh, you know, my first uh, worry was how do I tell my family, it was Father's Day weekend when I got this diagnosis on a Friday, uh, my first thought, I got to tell my wife and my daughters, and and, it, and my dad, who was 80 at the time, and, you know, he was coming over for Father's Day dinner at the governor's mansion, and he actually took it harder than anybody. I mean, he, you know, it doesn't matter how old you get. I was to him, his still his little boy that he couldn't uh, keep, keep out of trouble and protect, so he cried the whole time. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, I then on, uh, came out and had to announce it to the whole state of Maryland. I tried to be very transparent and, um, and share it with them. Uh, they had just six million people had just put their trust in me. Uh, and uh, I had to explain to them I was going to continue to try to keep working. And I worked from the hospital bed, uh, continuing to try to run the state and, and uh, came out of it, thank God, you know, stronger than ever. Yeah. Uh, aside from 
find the best doctors you can um, advice, governor, is for people going through a similar experience as you did. Is there, you know, if you dig deep, you know, is there a, one really important piece of advice uh, that you might give? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd well, love to hear it. I'm a, I'm a big uh, believer in the power of prayer. I had an awful lot of people uh, praying for me. Um, I, I think having a positive attitude, I think the, the mental part of, you know, this is besides the physical ravages of these diseases, trying to stay positive and focused on getting healthy is important. Having a support network, um, not just your family, but people that care about you. I was lucky enough to have thousands of people across the state that were pulling for me. Not everybody has that. Um, and have an incredible, you know, to try to get the best uh, medical care and attention you can and listen to your doctors. I was lucky because in Maryland, we have, um, you know, amazing uh, medical facilities and, and uh, had great uh, doctors and nurses who were taking care of me. But um, it's, uh, I think, I think people need a support network and they've got to stay positive and, uh, and they'll get through it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another terrible illness for a few minutes and you covered I know in uh, some of the final chapters in your book and uh, obviously that's uh, coronavirus you know out here at the Reagan Library in California uh, governor you know we're still in the state uh, facing a tremendous crisis the number of cases continues to grow and the number of deaths grow etc but you all seem to have gotten a, a good, a better handle on it in Maryland. And, and I know it's been one heck of a struggle. Uh, how have you been able to do that? Well, um, I don't want to get um, too overconfident because we do have a pretty good handle on the numbers right now, but we're not being complacent. I mean, this virus is by no means behind us. And I believe that you know, we have the potential uh, for this to continue to get worse um, going into the fall. And we're seeing alarming uh, spikes and increases across the country. Um, the virus doesn't recognize state borders. Uh, and uh, some, you know, some people are taking different actions and it's affected where they are in the curve and how successful they've been in flattening the curve. Right now, um, our metrics that we're following are, are still trending uh, pretty, pretty good. Um, number of cases uh, is, you know, we're, we've increased testing dramatically. So, if you test a lot more people, cases are going to go up a little bit. But we look at positivity rates. We look at uh, hosp hospitalization, how many people are filling hospital beds and ICU beds and our death rates, all of which are trending down. But, um, you know, we've got to stay vigilant and stay on top of this. Um, we saw some states that were, you know, relatively in good shape that have just out, are out of control now. And we've got to listen to the advice of the public health uh, professionals, the epidemiologists and the, the smart scientists. Um, we've got to wear masks and social distance and do all those kinds of things. We successfully and safely reopened about 98% of our economy. We reached the peak of the virus about 90 days ago, and we, and we have downward trending numbers, but we're, we watch it every single day. And if we have to take actions to stop it, um, we're, we're going to you know, not hesitate to make those decisions. Um, we had to make some very difficult decisions when this, uh, we had some difficult times back in the early part of this, as, as did every state in the, in the nation. Uh, and it, uh, I never imagined uh, being in this kind of a position or taking, making the kinds of decisions that we had to, but uh, almost every day we were uh, taking decisions, uh, making decisions that had to be made to, to keep people safe. Sure, sure. And this is uh, not an uh, inexpensive feat, is it? Meaning, I'm sure all this unexpected uh, virus in all 50 states has caused real havoc in the uh, state's financial system. How's it going in Maryland? Well, it's uh, the state's financial systems are, are, are really being impacted, but it's really impacting the economy. I'm most concerned about what it's doing, you know, to all those small businesses out there, the unemployment that has skyrocketed and the loss of revenue, um, the, those, all those additional people that we've got to help. But because of that, because people aren't working and because businesses uh, are suffering and because people aren't out spending money because they don't feel safe, um, the, the revenues to the states are down. And in, in, in many states, um, revenues are projected to be down as much as 25 or 30%. We're, we're not uh, as bad as some other states, but we're, we're gonna be really impacted and have to make uh, very tough 
uh, uh, fiscal decisions in the state about how we're, we, how do we provide more services to more people who are really in need with a lot less revenue? Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be uh, tough for governors across America. Is it still a sticking point, Governor, uh, between the White House and the, the state's governors on whether there will be any federal assistance to help manage the impact at the state level? I don't know if you would call it a sticking point, but we have um, differences of opinion um, sometimes between the governors and, and the White House. And we have, uh, look, I chair the National Governors Association, and I, I work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and have throughout this entire pandemic. Um, I, I, I think we've had 40, uh, 41 or 42 c calls with all of the nation's governors, uh, many of them um, uh, with, with the president and or vice president and the cabinet. The communication both with the administration and with governors on their own and governors only calls has been, has been good. Um, and uh, the governors are really, have been really good about sharing best practices about what's going on in your state? How have you dealt with this? How, how is this working? But with their, their, and, the, and the federal government has stepped up with respect to the CARES Act and some funding out there that's desperately needed to help uh, people who are unemployed and help some of those small businesses and to help us with certain issues. But, but we're also a little bit frustrated and sometimes we're not getting all of the assistance and help that we need. I think we could have had a national testing strategy early on in this, in this process that would have been helpful. It was a bit of a 50 state scramble with everybody kind of making things up on their own. And, and uh, I don't want a Monday morning quarterback because we're still in the middle of this. And, and we, it's going to take the federal, state and local government all working together to continue to fight this battle. Uh, but uh, we, the, the good news is we're all communicating and, and trying to work through these differences of opinion. Yeah. And I know, Governor, the media some oftentimes uh, tends to overplay um, if there's uh, any criticisms or dispute between the governors and, uh, and the president. Um, but, but well, you, you know how you that yourself... you know how that works. You'll have a long uh, conversation, uh, most of which is fairly productive. And uh, one sentence will get pulled out of there that blown into a headline. And it seems more uh, hostile or negative than it's intended to be. But, uh, um, you know, I, I would say there has been some friction and there has been disagreement. Uh, but we're, we've also been, you know, appreciative uh, uh, for the help that we've gotten. And, and, and we, when the president's doing a good job, uh, when the governors agree, we, we certainly recognize that. And, and when we feel that they're falling short or when there are real needs that the states have, um, you know, I haven't been afraid to stand up and, and, and tell them, you know, fairly directly. I mean, that's my job as the chairman of the governors. Yeah, yeah. Um... You mentioned national testing strategy. I, um, if there were one single element about the administration's uh, actions during all this, is that the one where you say, boy, we really should have thought that through better? And, you know, that would have been of most help for uh, the governors of the states. I think, you know, you, I talk about this in my in my book about the early uh, stages of this, because I was really writing about back in the March, April time frame, early May. Um, at the early stages, had we gotten more aggressive, there were some really smart people in the administration that were aware of what was happening and were giving advice to the White House, but I think they were a little bit slow on developing this and saying, let's leave that up to the states. I appreciate states' flexibilities, but there were certain things that only the federal government had the ability to do, and, and I think uh, a, a massive testing program early uh, could have helped us uh, stop the spread at an earlier stage before we had, you know, 140,000 deaths and, and this thing spiraling out of control in a number of states. But, you know, I, and I think the messaging, uh, while the, we had great meetings with the Coronavirus Task Force with the Vice President and all these leaders, sometimes the President's um, communication was different than what we were hearing from the rest of the administration. So I think the messaging was, uh, was one of the big problems we have. We're talking about, here we are, Reagan, uh, you know, was such a great communicator. And I think the communication skills fell a little short on this coronavirus for the president. Yeah, understood. Uh, fair point. Um, schools, you know, out here in California, uh, around the Reagan Library, most of the state, uh, we got the unfortunate news uh, just last week from our governor, uh, Newsom, 
that uh, for the fall semester, at least all the public schools uh, are going to need to operate online uh, rather than in person. Have you made uh, a, a decision uh, in the state of Maryland how the schools will operate? Because I'm sure there's a lot of parents concerned about that. You know, every, everybody's concerned about, you know, how do we, I think everyone would like to see us get our kids back in the sc in, into schools as quickly as we can. And I think it's really important uh, to actually have kids back in the classrooms. Uh, but we also need to make sure we, we go about it in a way that's safe uh, for the kids and for the teachers. And, um, and so we're, we haven't made the final decisions yet. The way it works in our state, we have an independent uh, state board of education who put out a a plan, kind of a, a framework of a plan about a month ago. And they've been now getting input from each of our jurisdictions to put a draft together. I think what we're gonna probably see in our state is some flexibility in areas that are impacted and affected differently where some people may be uh, doing more online learning, some people in some type of a hybrid and maybe other schools that are actually able to open up. But we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it, follow CDC guidance, which has been excellent. And, um, and listen to the public health professionals and, and just try to do everything we can to get kids learning again in, in a safe way and, 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 and err on the side of um, getting kids learning again and in the classrooms, but doing it safely. Sure, sure. You, um, uh, there's a terrific few, several chapters in your book, Governor, uh, where you talk about you know, one of the most difficult uh, situations you've had to face uh, with the terrible, unfortunate circumstance involving Freddie Gray and the Baltimore police and all that, you don't, I don't need to tell you. Um, we're seeing similar situations like you faced um, in Baltimore occurring in cities throughout the United States today um, as a result of the tragic uh, killing of George Floyd. What lessons did you learn um, in, in tackling the situation in Baltimore that, uh, and I, you know, I, you don't want a Monday morning quarterback, but is there advice you would be giving to other governors now facing this situation in their own states? Yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels. And, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, I finished most of this book on February 1st and put it on hold. I had no idea at the time when I wrote those five chapters about the riots in Baltimore, how uh, much of a parallel there would be to what's going on now. But I had been governor just 89 days when the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city of Baltimore. And in the first, just the first few hours, um, uh, this was after the death of Freddie Gray at the very beginnings of the Black Lives Matter movement, just after Ferguson. Uh, but in the first few hours, uh, violence and destruction broke out in Baltimore. We had 400 businesses burned and looted and destroyed. And um, 127 police and firefighters were injured and hospitalized. And the city's police force was overwhelmed. And the citizens of Baltimore were crying out for somebody to come in and, and to try to keep them safe. And uh, I ended up uh, within a matter of hours uh, calling a state of emergency, sending in more than a thousand uh, police officers and 4,000 members of the, of the National Guard to try to bring uh, peace and calm to the citizens of Baltimore. We did it in a way that we allowed the peaceful protests to take place uh, for a solid week. There were a lot of people expressing really legitimate frustrations and we, we did not want to aggressively move against those protesters to further inflame um, the situation, but we stopped and did not allow any more violence or destruction after that, that first night. Um, and we, we, uh, it, we did it very successfully. I think we got uh, praise across the country for that. I think not, it, the people of Baltimore appreciated it, which is, uh, uh, was important. Uh, they felt like things were gonna be okay and we lowered the temperature uh, and I think that's part of the problem today. There are two things going on. One, cities are not handling the, the kind of violence and destruction. They're allowing it to take place. Too weak of a response. Um, and then in some cases we have, um, in, in, say in Portland, where there's just going on for months of destruction. And then this, the federal response, there's complaints about 
too aggressive and it's further inflaming. So I, I actually taught a course at the National Governors Association about how to handle a crisis like this. I think it, I quote Ronald Reagan in that I learned from him uh, peace through strength. And I think in this situation, you've got to send in enough manpower to keep people safe, to stop the violence and destruction, but not go in in a heavy handed tactic that's going to make the situation worse. And that's what we successfully did in 2015. And I'll say this time, as we saw some, um, some peaceful protesting across America, we also saw some really bad situations in many of our major cities. In Baltimore, um, we didn't have those problems this, this time. We had, uh, I was very proud of the citizens and the police force and the way, the way it, ha it was handled this time. I think it's a result of what yeah. happened in 2015. Yeah, uh, great. I'm glad I asked the question. And just a little a follow up. How about the advice? You know, I presume you want to give the same advice to the mayors, meaning um, this hesitancy uh, to this interest in letting people blow off steam. Um, it, it it causes an enormous problem, uh, does it not, uh, for the mayor themselves, for the governors of the states? It's, it just seems completely irrational to allow this kind of uh, violence to occur rather than get right on top of it. Yeah, absolutely agree. And that's, I talk about this in the book, and it's exactly what happened in early hours of the, of the situation in Baltimore in 2015, where the mayor, the, the then mayor of, of Baltimore uh, was ordering the police to stand down, to not respond. And she actually uh, went on television and said she was going to give uh, these uh, protesters the room to destroy, that she, it, she was not going to step in. And I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen a response like that. Just let them continue to destroy the city. I said we weren't going to give them room to destroy. We're going to bring in 5,000 people to stop them from destroying the city. And and uh, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, well, well done. I, I saw from your book, Governor, some pretty difficult conversations between yourself and the mayor. And <laughs> but uh, they, you know, I think people will find an inside a view of uh, kind of what it was like to go through that. And maybe some of these mayors and, and governors that are dealing with it now ought to take a quick read, at least of those few chapters. Maybe it might, they might find it helpful. Yeah, I think you're right. I do. Um, another. Uh, important issue in Maryland, I know, but it's important in Virginia, too, where I grew up, is uh, the, our, our dear, dear Chesapeake Bay. Um, how, uh, how are things going, Governor, for the, for the Bay? And, you know, is it, are we maintaining a kind of uh, attitude that's keeping it clean and uh, vibrant? How's, that, how's the Bay doing? Well, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, that sometimes people automatically assume, you know, you hear this Republicans are sometimes tainted with this tag that we don't care about the environment and, you know, Democrats are automatically supposed to be better for the environment. And I know my, my predecessor um, and the previous uh, governor liked to uh, claim that he was doing good things for the Chesapeake Bay, but we've actually been able to uh, invest more in protecting the bay and to preserve, uh, you know, through program open space, more land to keep runoff from going on. We did it in a more efficient and more effective way. The, the health of the Chesapeake Bay is the bay is now cleaner than it's been in recorded history. And that, that's after almost six years of really solid effort on our part. I couldn't be prouder of the team that we have in the state of Maryland. It's, uh, you know, we've been working on, on, on these clean water issues. The Chesapeake Bay is a national treasure uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's so important to uh, the region, uh, but really the country. And uh, it's, it's a model for, for uh, how you can go about cleaning up the environment without, without killing uh, business in, in, in the meantime. Yeah, the Bay, is, it's, it's part of the heart of uh, Maryland's uh, uh, economic business activity, right? If, it, if the Bay's not clean and, and going well, it's going to be difficult for people to make a living. So, and, uh, yeah, you know, we've got some great crabs in that Bay, too, as you know, as a Virginian. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, you have to I cross do. over to Maryland, yeah. good ones, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How are the crabs doing this year? Is it, doing they really okay? well. Is, I've, I've tested them out and sampled them personally, so. <laughs> <laughs> At Mike's Crab House, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, um, uh, let, let's talk about another difficult issue uh, for Maryland that you covered in your book um, that's uh, been a plague in all 50 states and 
that's the, the opioid crisis. Um, tell me how, how difficult has that battle been in Maryland and where do you sit in the fight? It's a really uh, very difficult uh, battle and one we've been wrestling with for a while. You know, when I was running for governor in 2014, it was not something that most people were that focused on. And I can tell you, I was traveling around. Our state is, is pretty diverse and it's, we have very rural areas and some pretty urban core and suburban areas. We were like an American miniature. We have a little bit of everything. Everywhere I traveled around the state, I would go into these communities and I would sit down with kind of leaders in the area and I would say, what's the number one problem facing your, your community here? And in every single instance, they said opioids. And I was shocked. This was not just in the city of Baltimore. It was in rich, uh, you know, wealthy suburban counties like Montgomery County, one of, the, one of the richest counties in America outside of Washington. It was in very rural, um, you know, agriculture communities, small towns. And I was shocked. I, I didn't I didn't know that that at that point. Now we're very aware of it. Um, but so I uh, focused on this. As soon as I was elected, I put my lieutenant governor, Boyd Rutherford, in charge of a, of a task force focused on opioid addiction. Um, we came up with a number of uh, suggestions and passed a piece of legislation to enact all of them. We've attacked it from every direction because it's tearing apart, you know, families and communities and from one end of the country to the other. It's, you know, killing people and it's costing us lives and money and focus. Um, and it's just uh, ravaging the country. And we've gone after it with everything we've got. And we've made some strides and we've stopped you know, the explosive growth, but it's, it's a tough one to get a handle. It's kind of like this coronavirus, you know, it's, we, we, you, you fix one part of it and another one pops up. It's, it's a little bit like whack-a-mole, um, but it's, it's, yeah. it's not growing at the rate that it used to be, but we haven't stamped it out. Uh, this fentanyl yeah. is a very dangerous drug for, you know, we, we, we got part of it under control and then this fentanyl came in from China, which is more deadly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, NGA, um, you know that's a, it's a it's a, a tribute, uh, Governor, to the, that you were chosen uh, to be the head of the National Governors Association. Uh, tell me how how's that job been for you? I know it can be. Um, I bet you it's helpful to you as a governor of the state of Maryland. You get to get a, see a good cross section of the issues occurring in other states. Maybe take best practices or ideas from them. Tell me about your chairmanship. Has it been do you think it's been an advantage for you as a governor? Well, yeah, sure. The, when I first was elected, I went to uh, what I call baby governor school, but it's really called the, the seminar for new governors. And um, I met, you know, some governors from across the country. And I was really impressed right away at the National Governors Association about how well people got along. I've been very involved in this organization now for almost six years. I've been on the executive committee and I was very um, honored that my colleagues unanimously chose me to, to, to lead them. I started out uh, in my position last July uh, with the, you get to pick a chair's initiative. And I, I started an initiative on rebuilding America's infrastructure. And we were doing this all around the country and we were making great progress. Uh, and it's still an important issue that we're focused on. But then this coronavirus broke out, which which made, I think, the Governor's Association even more important and more relevant than ever. I mentioned earlier, we have 40 some calls, uh, video conferences with all the governors. That hasn't happened in the past you know, 20, 30 years combined. And we've done it in a few months. Uh, and the cooperation, the collaboration between the governors has been uh, amazing, frankly. And, um, and I, I couldn't be, frankly, more proud of, uh, of all of the governors, really, uh, on both sides of the aisle for the way they've stepped up in this crisis. And the, and the National Governors Association, which many people probably didn't even know existed and haven't paid much attention to, and in some cases hasn't been that relevant, um, I think has taken on a whole new relevancy. I tell you, it's been a lot of work and it's taken a lot of time and effort, but I think it's been worth it. I think we really have led uh, during this crisis. And so, you know, it's, um, it, it was an opportunity during a time when I think America and our states really needed somebody to step up, uh, for the governors to step up. And, you know, I was happy to be able to lead the, uh, the governors during this time. Yeah, Governor, what is it about the environment, the dynamic um, in the National Governors Association, at least in your experience, 
that, you know, it's actually probably one of the most productive bipartisan <laughs> groups in America that's actually getting something done. I wonder if there was some way we could borrow or steal from that model. Well, I, I sure would. The nation. Yeah, I sure would like to get the folks in Washington and Congress to follow that model. I talk about that in my book a little bit because I think most people in America are somewhat frustrated with the divisiveness and dysfunction where, you know, nobody can ever get anything done and nobody gets along and it's such a, you know, a, a, a personal battle back and forth. It wasn't always this bad, I don't think, in Congress, but the governors are different and unique. I mean, you talk about Governor Reagan, his leadership, a lot of governors have been successful uh, and become uh, president. Um, but the, the, um, the governors are sort of CEOs uh, that, that, that who have to uh, govern their states every single day. They're running a government. They're like presidents of a smaller you know, uh, operation, but they, they're in the executive branch. We're not in direct competition with one another. It's not in Congress, you're fighting every day on a committee, you're arguing in state legislatures, you're trying to defeat uh, this person or that person. The governors, uh, I'm not in competition with my uh, fellow governors. I, we sit down and say, you know, how are you dealing with this problem? And it's, it's almost as if there are 50, uh, you know, CEOs of companies sitting around saying, you know, what can we do to, you know, do a better job of, you know, growing our businesses? Uh, we're, we have to provide the same kinds of services. We have to get up every day and make sure our states are functioning and, and uh, providing all these services. And, and governors, for the most part, we, we disagree on issues. Don't get me wrong. But we're not in competition and we're not out there wearing blue jerseys and red jerseys every day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this was my clever way of getting you uh, to start a conversation with you about uh, the presidency, not necessarily the presidents of these smaller states, but uh, the presidency of the United States. And I know um, last year um, you, um, perhaps it was your experience at the NGA, but you've got to look at the whole nation. I think you traveled to New Hampshire. You've thought about uh, maybe there's a, a role and a run for you someday. Is that right? Well, it was, um, it's, it's not exactly right. I didn't really uh, think about it too much or too hard, but there were a lot of people after I was, I was reelected in the worst possible year in a deep uh, blue state and a, with a blue wave when we lost the Congress and we lost uh, many sitting governors and five open governors races, we lost state legislative bodies across the country. I was overwhelmingly reelected in a landslide. Uh, and, and, and second Republican in 242 years to do so in my state. So people started saying, um, hey, how do you do that? H how do you appeal to a wider, Reagan's theory of, of a bigger tent and, and Reagan Democrats, I, I was able to get Democrats and independents to, to swing over and vote. And we've done well with suburban women and minorities and things that we're not doing as a party. People started saying, would you consider how about this? And, um, and I know there was a lot of talk about that, but I never put together any real effort uh, to move in that direction. And I now, now that I've put this book out, there's been a lot of speculation. I, you must have written a book because you're concerned about 2024. I think it's far too early, I think, uh, to talk about that. I've got a great job as governor of Maryland uh, until January of 2023. I'm in the middle of you know, twin uh, crises of dealing with the economic crisis, the, the world global pandemic. And, and, and I'm going to try to stay focused on, on that, but uh, I do want to be a part of the, of the future discussion about where we go as a Republican Party. I've been active in the party my whole life, and, and, uh, and since I got so excited about Ronald Reagan especially, um, and um, I, I'm concerned about the fact that we're not listening to that advice that Reagan gave. We don't have that hopeful, positive uh, message and vision that's attracting more people and growing that bigger tent. Uh, and, and I wanna be a, at least a part of that discussion. I, I'm not as concerned, I don't care so much about what my future is in the Republican party, but I'm really concerned about having a, a future for the Republican party because it, this, this, you know, us winning elections and being able to win over and you know, get things done and the, the continuation of the party and the two party system is critical. Uh, but we got to win elections in order to do that. And so uh, we have plenty of time to talk about that over the next four years. We have to see what happens in November. But I think yeah. the party's going to take a hard look after November about what we're going to do and be in the future and whether we're going to continue in the direction we're heading 
or whether we're going to perhaps go back and look at some of the lessons of what we've accomplished here in Maryland, but also how uh, Ronald Reagan was able to revive the party uh, after after Watergate. We started the conversation with my dad and, and at, after Nixon, everybody said it was the death of the party and we came back pretty strong. Yeah, that's right. Uh... This topic you've just gone uh, taken us through, Governor. It's in my mind, as I read your book and listening to you now, it's it's absolutely fascinating. I think there uh, is going to be a moment, right, where um, it, whether Trump's reelected or not, there's going to be a moment when the party, when Trump's not the president, and the party's going to have to ask itself some difficult questions. And uh, I, is it not? It's a situation where there will be. You know, were you a Trump Republican or were you a Reagan Republican? Um, uh, you've learned so much in, in this, and I, I think what you're saying is your experience in Maryland has been a winning formula. And whether Trump's reelected or not, the party has got to look at at, at exactly that. Uh, is that right? Uh, that's a great great way to sum it up. And I I think we are going to have that discussion, regardless of what happens in November. Either way, I think the party has got to to really take a look at uh, where we're heading and what we stand for and, uh, and how we're going to continue to build a winning coalition. Um, I think it's critically important and we're gonna have those discussions in just a few months. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, if you got drafted into the role, and so I know I'm talking completely hypothetically, but sum up for me if you would, how would uh, Larry Hogan presidency differ from the Trump presidency? Are there some key differences that you'd put your finger on and say, well, for sure, I do this different, this different, or that different? Well, I think, you know, if you look at um, how we've been able to be successful here in Maryland, I would say a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, what I've been really focused on, and it's a, it, it's a lot like what I admired about President Reagan. President Reagan, um, he, he really stood up for the things that he believed in but he also was willing to sit down and reach out to the other side. We had that great relationship with Tip O'Neill. Um, they got things done together. Um, they found that, that common ground, that middle ground where they could reach agreement. Um, I think that's what's missing today. Um, I've always believed, uh, you know, I, 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 want to I try to avoid the extremes of either party and the divisive rhetoric um, and you know, I've had to, out of necessity in my state, 70% of my legislature is, uh, are liberal Democrats, but we've had tremendous success in gotten things done because I don't try to demonize the other side. I try to listen to where they are and try to move our ideas forward. And I'm a big believer in that compromise is not a dirty word. And that, um, you know, we ought to be, I think what most people are looking for are just common sense bipartisan solutions. And I think there's a big chunk of America that's just frustrated with the whole political system right now. And, um, you know, I love the fact that Reagan brought people together across party lines and, and had a hopeful, positive vision and uh, stood up for the principles he believed in, but was willing to reach out. I, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something about 80%. It was, it was better to the quote. You, you know the quote, I'm sure. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. 80% of a loaf of bread is better than nothing, right? So, right, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it got things done. And and sometimes by by just uh, being so strident, uh, you know, I think you're more effective. I know I've gotten a lot more done uh, by working together and and, uh, and trying to uh, find that, that way we can uh, reach agreement. Yeah, well said, Governor. Um, let me just say, Governor, I, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. The, the, uh, and I, the book, it, it hits the stands next week, or is it actually out this week? When uh, When's it being published? Coming out next week. And um, okay, I'm looking yeah. forward. I hope people will enjoy it. I, I, I enjoyed uh, writing it. I'm glad you enjoyed reading it. And I, I can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate you having me. Uh, talking with you today. I'm sorry we were not able to do it in person. I was so excited about being there, uh, but I think this is probably the safer way to do it. And, and, I, and hopefully maybe even more people will get a chance to, uh, to watch here online in a safe way, socially distanced. Yeah. So thank you. Well, yeah, sure. And Governor, know that when we've got a vaccine and we've got this virus behind us, you uh, consider it an open invitation for you to actually come out and speak here uh, at the Reagan Library, and I, I really hope that happens because 
you know, I while I might have grown up, uh, you know, in the Delmarva area, um, the impression one has from afar of this Republican Larry, Governor Larry Hogan um, is that they find in the media is really um, your book. It's you're so much more different than that. Uh, that you have, you as you said, you're a Reagan Republican, and it shines through in this book. And I really hope people, if they want to understand you. Uh, we'll take a read of it. Well, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care of yourself, Governor. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.